So welcome to the AMATIC 2019 webinar series. My name is John Oakes and I am the interim AMATIC professional development coordinator and today's presentation is on the scholarship of teaching, learning, and college mathematics with Megan Bright Goodwin and Jackie DeWar and is sponsored by the Research in Mathematics Education for Two-Year Colleges or our medic. So please note that the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC and any commercial products mentioned by presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC and McGraw-Hill Higher Education is proud to support the 2019 AMATIC webinar series. And now while we have Megan bring up the slides, I will introduce our speakers uh, one more time. So if you haven't already welcomed them in the chat room, please do so now. But Megan teaches mathematics and statistics at Anoka Ramsey Community College in Minnesota, and she leads the AMATIC Project Slope Research Fellows Program. And Jackie is a professor emerita of mathematics at Loyola Marymount University has worked with two and four year college faculty in undertaking scholarly investigations of teaching and learning. And she is an experienced SOTO scholar and mentor and co-author and co-editor of two books on SOTO and college mathematics. So if you don't know what SOTO stands for, you'll hear all about it today because that's what this webinar is about. So let me turn it over to Megan and Jackie, and please give them a, a wonderful welcome in the chat room. Thank you, John. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar on the scholarship of teaching and learning. We're really glad that you're here. It looks like we have representation from many different places, and it's exciting to see the growth of the scholarship of teaching and learning in our two-year colleges and within AMATIC. I'm Megan Bright Goodwin, and I'm coming from Anoka Ramsey Community College in Minnesota today, and I'll be presenting with Jackie Dewar from Loyola Marymount University in in California. As John said, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. John will be monitoring those questions and we will have a question answer period towards the end of the webinar where we hope to address some of those questions that come in. Today's webinar is part of AMATIC Project Slope. The AMATIC Project Slope Research Fellows Program is a pilot program within AMATIC where six members are joining together in a faculty learning community as they conduct a SOTL inquiry within their classrooms. Project Slope is a National Science Foundation funded initiative. Any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in today's webinar are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. We'll begin today with a polling question where we're wondering what you are hoping to learn about the scholarship of teaching and learning through the webinar. The scholarship of teaching and learning is often abbreviated SOTL and we'll call it SOTL throughout today's webinar. It's also pronounced SOTL, so uh, that acronym there has now been connected. So John put the poll up and we'll give you a bit of time to respond to the poll. Oh, great. Thanks, John. So, all right. So it looks like we had a lot of people wondering about what SOTL might look like within two-year colleges um, and questions about how to get started. What is it? Um, and also ways to think about how we integrate it in our teaching. Uh, we will actually be addressing all of these things, in particular uh, through some examples where we show what SOTO looks like in the first two years of college math. 
And one of the examples will come from my own SOTO work in a two-year college. Um, so uh, we also, of course, are looking forward to answering the specific questions that do pop up. Um, today's webinar is structured into three parts. The first part of the webinar will be an overview of what SOTL is, and the example of a SOTL project will be given from a quantitative literacy course. Part two will specifically speak to SOTL in two-year colleges with an example of a project that was done in a statistics course. And then part three will be question and answer where we can attend to some of those questions that come in. Jackie will begin by sharing a bit about what the scholarship of teaching and learning is. Thank you, Megan. And Thank you, Megan. Can you hear me? There. Okay. So I'm so glad to be part of this. Uh, a quick comment. There's a little bit of construction going on next door to where I am, so you may hear a few noises in the background. John said it sounds like a plane flying over, so we'll see. So the first part of this webinar has four parts. Now there can be some confusion about what SOTL is, so we'll begin there in a moment. Then I'll give a formal definition of it, discuss three different types of SOTL questions that might actually start off an investigation, and then talk about a SOTL study that was done in a QL, short for quantitative literacy course. One of the many sources of confusion about SOTL and its value to higher ed is the failure to distinguish between these three things, good teaching, scholarly teaching, and the scholarship of teaching and learning. So we'll talk about that first. Good teaching can be understood in terms of the learning that takes place. How much is learned? How deep is that learning? How long does it persist? Was it transformative in any way? Scholarly teaching occurs when an instructor not only has excellent knowledge of the disciplinary material they're teaching, but also knows about research on instructional design and how students learn, and then uses all of that to make decisions about instruction and assessment. But SOTL is different. It's more than just using the research on teaching and learning as instructors. It's about adding to the knowledge base of what we know about teaching and learning. And here's a formal definition with some things emphasized. So SOTL is the scholarly work that faculty do when they bring their disciplinary knowledge to bear on questions of teaching and learning, draw conclusions based on evidence gathered from students in a systematic way, subject their findings to peer review, and make them public for others to build on. Now, I have a special note here. Because SOTL often involves making public the work of students, it's considered research with human subjects, and federal rules apply, similar to the ones that govern medical research, so that informed consent is obtained from the subjects. Now, federal guidelines require review and approval of all such research by an oversight committee, typically at the institution. This committee is usually called an institutional review board. However, to conduct an investigation just for your own benefit and knowledge and not ever present or publish the results would not require review. And there was a handout that was sent out before the webinar and I encourage you to take a look at that because it has more information about all of this. But here's a very useful way to think about SOTL. In SOTL, a teaching situation or problem becomes an invitation to begin a scholarly inquiry. So the entry point to a SOTL investigation typically comes from a problem or frustration encountered in one's own classroom. These entry points can be characterized by the type of question we ask. SOTL research typically falls into one of three categories. We can actually think of these question types as doorways to an investigation. What works is the initial doorway that most people starting in SOTL go through. 
They want to show that some new approach or method actually works to improve student learning. But often they discover they need to take a look through the second doorway first and to answer a what is question because they realize they need a better understanding of what is actually happening before they can attempt to change or improve it. And the third type of question is called what could be. It refers to being in a special situation that you might want to document. But if you start here, you can still end up answering some what works and what is questions, as you'll see in my example. Here are written descriptions of each question type. What works is asking, does this teaching method work or work better? What is questions want to know, what are the students really doing or thinking or feeling in a certain situation or about a particular concept or topic? What could be questions are sometimes called a vision of the possible because we just want to show that something is possible, not argue that it's always going to happen. We may be trying to document a situation where something really good or interesting happens or we expect it to happen. So let's take a look at a total study done in the first two years of college math at my institution. It was in a quantitative literacy course, QL. That was the primary way that students whose major did not require a math course met the university's gen ed requirement. The overarching course goal for QL was to provide the students with quantitative skills that would be useful in their future. There was no math prerequisite for this course beyond admission to the university. That meant you could have a history major who had taken calculus in high school sitting right next to an art or a film major who had only had three years of high school math and that didn't even include pre-calculus. So engaging students who had such widely varying math backgrounds was definitely a teaching problem. In fact, some students were anxious about taking the course while others were disengaged or bored by it. One wrote to the student newspaper calling it idiot math. So you could say there was a learning problem. Fortunately, an opportunity arose to do something about this. It came from CENSOR, which stands for Science Education for New Civic Engagements and Responsibilities. And CENSOR is an NSF-funded curriculum project that promotes teaching science and math through real-world problems. And this webinar audience would be interested to know that the CENSOR initiative is ongoing today and it accepts proposals from two-year and four-year college math faculty. So two math colleagues, Suzanne Larson and Thomas Zachariah, and I obtained a small grant and lots of guidance from Censor to modify our QL course. And what we did was we had students work in teams and use the math they were learning in class to conduct research projects on local issues of interest to them. And our experiment took place in five out of 20 sections that were taught that year. Now this experiment was much larger than your typical SOTL project, but having collaborators was what made that possible. And so it began as a what could be investigation. What happens if group projects on community issues are incorporated into a typical QL course? But as you will see, some what works and what is questions followed later on in our study. But before I talk about that, let me show you some of the projects the teams of three or four students worked on. One group investigated who does and doesn't use the Student Health Center and why or why not. And the Student Health Center actually used the results of their study in their accreditation report. Another group wanted to know which was the best coffee venue on campus. Still another, is there enough campus parking and is it safe? And there were many more uh, investigations of this type. Now let's take a look at the mathematical tools that the experimental course gave the students to work with and how that content compared to the regular QL course. So both courses began with very basic material on number sense, 
followed by a segment on the mathematics of finance, and that then followed by um, material on elementary statistics. Now, the standard course had material on elementary probability theory and the theory of voting, which we took out so that we would have time to model a project on student loan debt for the students so that they would see how their projects might proceed, and um, also to give the team some time in class to meet face to face, which might have been difficult for them because of their varying schedules to meet outside of class. So in addition to that same overarching course goal of providing students with quantitative skills that would be useful in their future, we wanted this experimental course to achieve some added student learning outcomes. At the end of the course, we wanted our students to be aware, really aware of the usefulness of math, have greater confidence in using it, be able to use mathematical tools to describe, analyze, and make recommendations about community issues, and to be engaged with a community issue, and more likely, we hope, to do so in the future. Because this was a gen ed class, we were fortunate we had a pre-existing assessment in place. All QL students took a pre-post multiple choice test on course content. That test had 12 questions, nine of which were appropriate material for our experimental version, and we were given permission just to use those nine questions with our students. Now, Knowing this much about the class, John's going to have a polling question for you in just a second. What evidence would you gather for this what could be question? What happens if group projects on community issues are incorporated into a typical QL course? And I believe you're going to be answered. Are you so, going to ask just uh, so Jackie, uh, yeah. can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Uh, be, because this might be a good time before I actually launch the poll. We had two uh, questions. Would you like to answer them now or after the poll? Um, I think after the poll. Okay. Uh, then I will go ahead and launch the poll now. Oh, I, I see the questions there on the side. Is that what I should pop up? Sure. I'll answer those now. Okay. So, because I was at Loyola Marymount University, a private institution, I wasn't dealing with state learning outcomes. I was dealing with learning outcomes for the gen ed class. And we really didn't change, we just added some learning outcomes. We didn't take out any. We did take some material out, it's true, but it was a small part of the course. Um, and the permission to use those nine questions, uh, yes, it came from IRB, but it also came from the course coordinator for all the sections. That was fine for our course just to ask those questions rather than all 12. I hope that helps. And so John's got his polling question up there. So it looks like about half of you have already voted. So I will give you a, uh, a couple more seconds here to try to look through all the choices here. So while we're waiting for the rest of the people to vote, Jackie, there was one more question from Frank. Uh, was the QL course pass-fail or did students earn a letter grade? Sure. Um, virtually all the students earned a letter grade. There was, I believe, a credit, no credit option, but I'm totally unaware of, and I've taught that course many times, both the experimental way and others. And I don't ever recall, actually, maybe because it's a gen ed class, you couldn't do credit, no credit. Um, so I, let me just say, they all learned a letter grade, almost certainly. Okay, so 
This is interesting um, to see that the focus group and the student opinion came in the highest. But actually, all of your selections are good, and here's why. Each of these types of evidence aligns with one or more of the outcomes that we hope to achieve. An alignment between your evidence and your research question or your outcomes is critical if you want to answer your question or measure the success of those outcomes. So in fact, and I, in fact, we collected all of these different types of evidence. Again, remember I had some collaborators. Um, but in gathering our evidence, we were mindful of the students' time and our own time as instructors. The first three items were integrated into the coursework, so they required no extra work on the part of the students. Um, participation in the extra surveys and the focus group was voluntary, so only the students who wanted to do that did. But they were extra work, of course, for the instructors to prepare, administer, and analyze. Let me show you some of the what works and what is questions that we were able to answer with this evidence that we gathered. So two what works questions. Does the experimental sensor course uh, improve student understanding and confidence? And we could say yes based on the pre-post-test data we had and also the knowledge survey which is an instrument where students are asked to rate their confidence in their ability to do certain specific problems or tasks from the course. And do sensor students learn more, meaning more than the students who were in the regular QL sections? And the answer was a little bit. On one of those nine shared post-test questions, it had to do with picking the best explanation for the margin of error. Sensor students performed significantly better than students in the standard course, but there was no significant difference on the other eight questions. Now, when we thought about this afterwards, we realized that the other eight questions were all computational, like compute the monthly payment on a car loan with a certain amount that was borrowed at a certain interest rate. So both courses were doing a pretty good job of teaching computational type material. But when it came to explaining the margin of error, because so many of our sensor students in their teams had chosen projects that involved them actually making up and taking surveys, they not, were not only computing a margin of error there, but when they gave their final reports, in writing and orally in class, they had to explain what that number meant in their particular situation. Another what works question, does the sensor approach work to teach students to use mathematical tools to describe, analyze, and make recommendations about community issues? And again, the answer was yes, and we had wonderful evidence from the project reports that they produced. And a what is question. What do students think about the projects? And that was definitely from the focus group. We got a very positive response. Nearly 80% of the students said we should keep them. Now, if you want more details about how these projects were organized or the data that was collected and how it was analyzed, you can see um, either this article, a journal article, or this resource that's available online. Going public with total results can also mean presentations, which we did a lot of those, as well as publications like these. Of course, having sensors structure and support helped us set and achieve that goal of getting a journal publication. But I assure you, while a lot of SOTL is never published, it may just be presented, it is still very valuable work. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan. Mute me. 
Okay, <laughs> thanks. In this next section, I'll discuss SODAL and how it fits into two-year college mathematics. To begin, I'm going to ask a very pragmatic and important question, and that is, does SODAL fit into our work? Historically, two-year colleges have been teaching institutions, and two-year college faculty often identify first as teachers and not as researchers. Researcher, research is not typically part of existing reward structures for our work as two-year college educators, and in most extreme cases, questions might arise as to whether or not research actually takes away from our work as educators. So I start with the idea that yes, teaching is central to our work. Now, let me challenge the idea of what teaching is. Because teaching involves lesson planning, leading classes, meeting with our students, and of course, assessing student work. But it's also much more than that. Teaching is a profession that involves reflection and development, and that's development of curriculum, lessons, programs, and institutions, and our own professional development. Going back to the definitions of good teaching, scholarly teaching, and the scholarship of teaching and learning, each of these characterizations of teaching goes well beyond the act of meeting the time in class with our students. And in this way, SOTL is itself an act of teaching and it can be part of our profession. So how does that really, like how is SOTL an act of teaching? SOTL combines reflection, inquiry, and exchange on teaching. It can inform our practice and it also can improve teaching and learning. Importantly, it does that first in our own classrooms. SOTL has also been shown to renew engagement in teaching. It can help us stay evergreen in what we do as two-year college educators. I will now share a SOTL project that I conducted in my introductory statistics class at a two-year college. As um, I, Megan, before yeah. you uh, transition, I, a question came in about uh, what percentage of SOTL projects do you think are made possible because of a grant? I actually don't know the answer to that question, but I know that SOTL is definitely possible without the help of a grant um, and uh, because the projects don't necessarily have to be really, really big. Um, they can be scaled to specifically answer a question that directly applies to somebody's own teaching and learning in their classroom. I can't answer that question in a two-year context, but I would say in a four-year context, far more are done without grants than with. Mm -hmm. And the small grant that we had um, wasn't used to buy out time or give us extra time. It was to buy a few little things and to travel to the sensor meeting. All right, um, so as I talk about my own SOTL work in my statistics course, I'm going to really uh, emphasize the ways that it was fully integrated into my teaching. I'll begin by explaining the problem that led me to want to make changes in my teaching, as well as how that led to do SOTL inquiry as a way to really look at the impacts of those changes that I was making. My SOTL project centered on a student learning unit um, in descriptive statistics. What I looked at was student learning and their self-confidence. My own framing of the importance of descriptive statistics is shared here. I believe that they help us make sense of what we observe in data, 
They help us generate questions, select methods of analysis, and provide a basis for inference work. I had been teaching statistics for a few years when problems started to become rather apparent. I would classify my teaching as traditional methods, and this is an example of what I meant. My students worked with a lot of formulas, and I would often have them answer questions like the one presented here. And what I found was that my students, they got really good at answering questions like this. They definitely could compute a mean. In fact, they worked really well with formulas. I mean, my students, they could even work with this formula. So what was the problem? The problem was that if I changed the type of question that I asked my students to something like this, my students got stuck. And going back to what I believe about descriptive statistics, this is a really big problem because my students, they were developing a proficiency at computing descriptive statistics, but they really weren't demonstrating the ability to really interpret or leverage these measures to ask and answer questions or describe real data. In other words, I had a learning problem in my class. So I went on to actually ask my students, their thoughts of how things are going. And as we know, if you ask your students how things are going, we have to be prepared for their honest response. So one student shared that I should stop talking about cookies because nobody cares about the cookies. Another student was a little more gracious and said, you are at your best when you bring in the real stuff. And we learn best when you are excited about the real stuff. In other words, I not only had a learning problem, I also had a teaching problem. I wouldn't classify my classroom methods at this time as particularly effective, but the fact that I was taking the time to reflect on what was and wasn't working allows me to say that I was doing something that would fall under the category of good teaching. Importantly, I recognized that it was time to make changes. I read the Guidelines for Assessment and Instruction in Statistics Education College Report from 2016. I also attended an EMATIC webinar uh, about teaching with gaze recommendations. And most importantly, I participated in stat prep. And I participated in the St. Paul Hub there. It was really in stat prep that I had a transformative experience. Here's where I wrapped my mind around what I could do to actually teach in alignment with the recommendations that were set forth in GAZE. It helped me get my confidence up. I had a community around me, and it also gave me some skills that allowed me to go back to my classroom ready to make changes. It is here that I would say that I transitioned from good teaching to scholarly teaching. And so... What does my teaching look like now? Um, the unit on descriptive statistics is now also a really important unit where my students are onboarded onto the technology that we use. My students no longer spend a lot of time number crunching. Instead, they spend a lot of time looking across multiple representations of data. They work with a lot of concepts and uh, make definitions, and they uh, they really sort of develop facility with important measures and processes um, through their own questions and their work. They're in that data every day, and it's really fun. But this is very different from what I was doing before, and so a question started bubbling up for me, and that question was, if I'm no longer doing this number crunching formula and table stuff with my students, how am I actually sure that they're still meeting the learning outcomes for my class? And this right here was a question that evolved into the research questions that guided my SOTL inquiry. So not only was I now making changes, I also wanted to look at the impact of these changes. And it was time to do some inquiry. I participated in a local SOTL program at my institution called the Anoka Ramsey Community College Scholars Program. 
it was here that I really worked with this question of how do I know that my students are actually meeting these intended learning outcomes to develop research questions and implement a study to examine the impacts of gaze-informed teaching and learning methods. This is when I would say that I had really transitioned into the scholarship of teaching and learning, moving beyond scholarly teaching. For my research questions, I was guided by an overarching question that asked, what are the impacts of gaze-informed teaching and learning methods in introductory statistics? Now, this is a very broad question, and I would maybe classify it as a what is question, like what is going on when I do this? Um, but I had to tie it down with some very specific questions. And so I asked several sub-questions, and I'll talk about one of those questions today. And that question was very specific to students identifying, interpreting, and operating flexibly with measures of center and spread. The method that I used in my inquiry was a teaching experiment in which I was both the classroom teacher and also the researcher. I used gaze-informed teaching and learning methods, and my students worked with large data sets. Those formulas and computations that used to take up so much time in my teaching, they were still present, but they really took a back seat to data exploration, concept development, and a lot of student discourse. I bounded my inquiry around a specific learning unit, and that was a, the unit that really targeted descriptive statistics. I knew that I wasn't able to make change everything all at once, and I actually still consider myself on my journey of development in my teaching in statistics. But what I was able to do was really develop one unit in order, this one unit in order to do inquiry around it. Um, the following semester. So I had really been focusing on this for two semesters, and I did the inquiry my second semester using these methods. All of the data that I collected for my study was fully integrated into the course through assessments and student work. During the time I was teaching the class, I only used this data with my teacher hat on. It informed what we did in class. I didn't look at the data I collected for research purposes until after my final grades had been submitted. And even then, I waited two more months before I looked at it um, for research. I collected a lot of different data to look at this question of whether or not students were developing fluency with measures of center and spread. I'll focus on the CHAOS assessment, which stands for the Comprehensive Assessment of Outcomes in Statistics. This assessment looked at statistical literacy and conceptual understanding, not computation. It's an online assessment, and I found that it required minimal effort on my part as an instructor, and it gave me important insights while teaching and wonderful data to use in my SOTL inquiry. My students took the chaos as a pretest the week prior to the descriptive statistics unit, and again as a post test the final week of the semester. When they took the post test, it was 12 weeks after the close of the unit of, on descriptive statistics. I'll share a snapshot on some of the outcomes that I observed through the chaos assessment. In particular, we'll look at three of the items on the chaos that specifically address student interpretation of box plots and histograms and looked at their identification and comparison of measure of, of spread by looking at standard deviation. I use match pairs t tests to determine significant differences between pretest and post test percentage correct. The first item that we'll look at is item eight. And in this item, students made a comparison across two distributions that were represented as box plots. They were asked to determine which distribution had a larger standard deviation. I observed learning gains. Student performance improved by over 20%, but it was not very significant. 
The next two items that we'll look at are item 14 and 15 from the assessment. These were grouped items. They had students look at a collection of five different histograms representing different distributions. Item 14 asked students which distribution had the lowest standard deviation, and the target distribution for that response was actually bell-shaped. Item 15 asked students to determine which distribution would have the highest standard deviation, and the target distribution was actually not bell-shaped. I saw learning gains across both items uh, and significant learning gains on that item 14. In all, I looked at 13 chaos items that addressed the learning outcomes for the descriptive statistics unit. What I found was that students demonstrated modest learning gains in observing, describing, interpreting, excuse me, and interpreting distributions through graphical displays and numerical summaries of data. The significance of student learning gains was both mixed and modest, but it was sustained across 12 weeks, which was very encouraging for my practice. Not only has SOTO helped me make changes in my teaching, it has also provided opportunities to engage in scholarly exchange on teaching through presentations. I have enjoyed all the conversations I've had around my SOTL inquiry and it has helped me grow both in my teaching and it has helped my students in their learning and it has also increased my community with other teachers. At this time, we're going to transition to more of an interactive question answer portion for the webinar. And so I know a few questions have come in already, and we've already answered a few. Um, and right now, if you do have questions, we encourage you to put them in that chat box. John will continue to monitor them. And he also has some questions that came in prior to the webinar that were submitted. Um, but as you're maybe thinking of some questions, we preloaded a question into a slide that came in prior to the webinar. And so we'll, sh we'll sh talk about that question first. The question that we're going to look at is whether or not every SOTL study must involve changing or experimenting with something. And I'm going to let Jackie respond to that question first. Thank you, Megan. So the answer is uh, definitely no. Uh, not every SOTL study involves changing something. Um, what is questions stand on their own in the world of SOTL? So one of the most interesting um, projects that I worked on at my own institution was trying to find out how, um, what does the trajectory of understanding of proof in a typical math major look like as they moved through our math major curriculum? So I wasn't trying to show that something worked better to help students understand proof or do proofs. I just wanted to know what did this look like? How did their understanding evolve as they went through the curriculum? And a lot of us in SOTL think that what is questions are actually some of the most interesting ones as opposed um, to what works questions. Megan, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, I have a personal example as well that I actually conducted a SOTL study before I really knew what SOTL was that didn't involve changing anything. And in that study, uh, I went, I, uh, I did go through the process of achieving IRB approval and I had a very structured design for what I was doing for my inquiry. What I looked at was the actual experiences of returning adult learners, specifically adult learners who have completed a high school equivalency credential as they progress through our developmental math pathways. And what that inquiry did was it brought a lot of information first 
to our department that allowed us to move forward with making changes and creating new partnerships, in particular with our adult basic education um, partners within our community. Um, so it was definitely a uh, what is question that led to uh, significant changes within my department, but I didn't go in changing anything. I went in from a space of just pure curiosity of what's going on here. All right, well, there was another question here. So how are two-year colleges implementing SOTL, and uh, specifically for Megan, what type of support did you receive to do your SOTL project? So uh, structured SOTL programs are actually becoming more popular within two-year colleges, and um, we, I am aware and connected with several other programs that are taking place uh, throughout the nation. SOTL itself is a really high-impact way to uh, provide faculty with sustained professional development that will lead to um, changes in teaching and improved learning experiences for students. Um, they also don't take a lot of money to get going. Um, I'll speak specifically to my experience in my own local program. My program itself is interdisciplinary, and so I would say probably the most important support I received in my program was the faculty learning community that I worked with. So uh, they helped they helped me in all aspects of forming my questions. They were very encouraging. I had to make sure that my questions about statistics were palatable to a non-math audience right away. Um, the structure of the program itself was very supportive. We regularly met about once a month. We had just a two-hour meeting. Those meetings typically consisted of a uh, check-in, like where are you in your work and what have you done and what are your goals. We would have uh, different visitors come through from um, our Vice President of Academic Affairs to uh, representations from our Institutional Review Board to kind of help us through each stage of our process. But then those were often just work times. Um, I personally set aside about one hour a week that I focused on uh, developing my study, but that also was fully integrated into the development of my teaching. And I did receive a little bit of travel support so I could go to two additional conferences across two years. Um, and then also importantly, my SOTO program provided food for every meeting. All right, well, thank you, Megan. It looks like there is another question. So is there a repository of SOTO projects? Jackie, I'm gonna send that one to you. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking. Um, so you could easily see abstracts for SOTL projects um, over the last probably 10 years because I co-organize a session at the joint mathematics meetings every January on the scholarship of teaching and learning. And we always have somewhere between 15 to 20 papers presented there. Um, I, I can add that to the resources page that we send out afterwards. Um, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching used to have quite a bit of SOTL work on its website. Um, They've moved on to focus more on K-12 after spending about 20 years focused on SOTL. And so um, there's less there. I'll put that web address, I'll see what I can find and I'll put that on some handouts that'll be sent to everybody afterwards. Um, the other place to look would be in the basic SOTL journals. So now, SOTL is um, multidisciplinary. So people are doing this investigation of teaching and learning in engineering, in English, in history, in sociology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the SOTL journals 
will have examples of SOTL projects in all those fields. So you, you could, um, but just because we're in mathematics doesn't mean we can't learn something. In fact, I learn a lot from the work that people do in other disciplines. So um, I'll type into the, the chat box here the name of a couple of those journals, and we'll put something on the handout too about that. Uh, Megan? Yeah, you thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I, oh, yes, Megan, did you want to say something else about that? Uh, otherwise, I think there's another question in here for you. Um, no, I have nothing more on resources. Um, okay, so uh, the question was, oh boy, uh, were the pre and post test mentioned in addition to assessments that were normally part of the courses? Were the pre and post tests in addition to assessments that were normally part of the courses? Um, the, the pre, the pre test was just given on the first day of class. The post test was actually, um, I'm trying to think the rules were, it was 25% of the final exam grade. Can't remember if it was 25 or 50 percent. I have to go back and look it up. And then the instructor could, for the other part, remember it was multiple 12 multiple choice questions. And then the instructor could, for the other 50 percent, I'm going to say it was 50, but anyway, you understand the, the the actual percentage doesn't matter. Then the instructor in that particular section would um, have his or her own questions. Uh, that the student would fill out for the rest of the um, final exam grade. So I hope that answers the question. For uh, my use of the chaos as a pre and post um, assessment, I tried to keep the assessment environment similar for both the pre and the post. I didn't treat it like a test. Rather, um, what I did was I strongly encouraged students do your best. They got credit just for completing it. The way I used it as a pretest, I actually used it throughout the whole semester because it allowed me to understand very quickly, wow, my students really, they, they know what a, what a mean is and they know that the median is something different. Um, and uh, they also, uh, for example, I, I was surprised that they, uh, I had about I mean, it was, it was well over 80% of my students were able to identify a five number summary right off of a box plot. And that was like, wow, they have a lot of pre-existing knowledge that I could then sort of, you know, like make different entry points to the material and we could maybe go a little bit farther. But I did that throughout the entire course. So I used it as really a guide to my instruction, something I returned to throughout the course. And then I also used it as a post-test in that final week. Again, I just was like, okay, you all get credit for doing this and do your best. And I want to see how you're doing. And we're going to tailor our final exam review and our final, we had some uh, lab time that we were going to be hitting. And I wanted to tailor that around where I saw there could be a little bit of extra review focus. So, um, I think that students were motivated in similar ways, possibly more motivated on that final review because they were thinking about their final exam, um, but they didn't take it as a test. They took it really as more of something that was going to help us guide what was happening in class. I, I think that we have about time for one more question here since we only have a few more minutes left, but uh, what are the most common mistakes people make when beginning solo or perhaps when they begin conceptualization? Going too big. That's a great <laughs> question and I was going to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> Getting a question that's small enough to handle uh, is, is always um, <laughs> the issue. So ways to, to frame a question so it's small enough to research um, include, uh, you know, honing down in terms of 
the uh, question you're asking, the content-related part of it. Don't try to show that by adopting, using um, Megan's example, by adopting the gaze approach to teaching statistics, my students are going to do better in statistics. Instead, she focused on one very small segment of a course and use the gaze approach there. That's a beautiful example of how to, um, to uh, narrow a question. I think that one of the best, the, like this is just a tip here, but um, if, you can, if you can somehow work in community or in conversation with, um, with just another colleague or a friend who can help you really refine like these big questions. Like I wanted to change the way my students experience statistics, but I can't assess it all, right? In this, in, through a giant total project. It was really beneficial to just, I mean, it took me about, it took months. I, I don't even remember how long to really narrow those questions down. And uh, I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna estimate it took me well over three months to get my questions to a point that it could be manageable. Oh, and I'll say one more thing real quickly. Um, another mistake that people make is they don't navigate IRB. They don't start that process early enough. And so the rules usually are that you can't do any date, data collection until you've gotten the approval for your project. And so if you don't start soon enough, the semester might start um, before you have approval. Hmm. Yep. But if that's the case, you can still collect the data as, a, as a, just a means of like um, checking out uh, what it would be like if you did it. Um, in other words, it's not your official project, but it's a pilot project. And I think it's John's turn. Oh, yeah. So let's thank Megan and Jackie again in the chat room for the wonderful webinar and information today. And uh, thank you to all of you for participating in today's AMATIC webinar. And if you'd like to support future AMATIC webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC at bit.ly slash join dash AMATIC. And uh, please remember to like AMATIC on Facebook at facebook.com slash AMATIC. And recordings of past AMATIC webinars can be found at bit.ly slash AMATIC-webinars. And it may take us a little while to upload the webinar there, but it will get there uh, fairly quickly. And uh, if you could please take two minutes to evaluate the webinar content and the presenter today at bit.ly slash amatic82, that would be great. And if you need email confirmation of your participation in the webinar, please fill in the optional section at the end of the evaluation and I will make sure that you get your uh, certificate.